Okay, uh, welcome to the second uh, You Talking with Greg uh, with Nick and Andrea here. Um, so we were just uh, going over uh, our, so we're sort of meeting every other week uh, to explore this crazy system and to see how to relate to it and see if I can actually uh, share it in a way that metabolizes for Nick and Andrea and then actually has meaning or use or not. You know, we'll see. Um, Des. So today we have a couple of items that, we're, that we'll pick up on from last time. And, uh, and also they have generously been ag agreed to be readers for my book, uh, In Progress, The Problem of Psychology and Its Solution. Uh, what I thought we'd do maybe is after I we address some of the sort of living document questions that Andrea and Nick have raised, uh, then I'll give an overview of the book just for us to discuss so you know where it is. Yes. Okay, and then we'll maybe drift into at least the first two chapters that we've read. Uh, I also, you know, have a draft of the third chapter, which I'm actually in the process, perhaps, of revising. So that's what I propose. Uh, if that sounds good to you guys. Sounds good. Yeah. Game. Let's get in there. Boom. Okay. Well, why don't we go to the living document? Uh, and uh, and actually, there was one question right away that we perhaps can just address and maybe we can ask why, if, if I wasn't clear on it. So one of the big issues that I want to emphasize over re, that really is throughout the book is the following. And, and Nick, this may bleed into a question you had. Is I think we're, I think we're really confused about um, our basic philosophy of science categories around epistemology and ontology. Okay. And I want to argue that psychology is particularly confused, the science of psychology. Um, and that it is confused that both the concept of behavior and the concept of mental processes have ontological and epistemological aspects that can be disentangled and should be disentangled, but haven't been disentangled. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and central to the book is that project. Um, so uh, the, there are a couple of features of the unified theory that give rise to tools to both make the argument that it has not been effectively disentangled uh, and then proceed to effectively disentangle both behavior yeah. and mental process um, yeah. along those lines. Um, and this sort of most basic way to think about it or a basic way to think about it is that the tree of knowledge into the periodic table of behavior provides a way to map the ontology of behavior across uh, the stratified levels and dimensions in nature. So it's an ontological map of behavior at different frequencies. Um, it also it makes the case that epistemologically behavior uh, is the fundamental grammar for modern empirical natural science. Okay, so mm -hmm. that is, uh, that the, and if you're familiar with Wilbur's quadrants, uh, you can see the exterior quadrants uh, are marked first by behavior in the upper right, and then systems, and I would argue behavioral systems uh, in the lower left, uh, lower right, sorry. Um, anyway, and then we get into mental processes, okay? Um, and one of the things the categories of behavior does is it then says there's this subset of, we can divide behavioral things from a third person perspective into material behaviors as one dimension, uh, organic or living behaviors as a second dimension. Then there's this mental behavioral category, which is a key bridge between mental and behavioral theories in psychology. There's a mental behavioral category. Uh, and then a culture person behavioral category. Okay. And then the second real uh, descriptive metaphysical tool is the map of mind. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the map of mind says that there are really these in the concepts of the domains of mental processes, there are three fundamental reference, ontological reference that have different epistemological vantage points that have accessibility. Yeah. Uh, the first is mind one, and that refers to, and it's really consists of two domains. One is the overt mental behavioral activity of an animal that's just available from a third person observational perspective. So if your dog comes running over to you, you are seeing overt mental behavior okay, as it runs over to you. Then there are covert neurocognitive functionalist properties 
that are modeling and computationally regulating that action. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is what I call mind 1B, a subset of mind 1B that's between the animal environment, that's directly observable from an outside view. And the second refers to the activity behavior of the nervous system, which is available through observing neurophysiological activity, and then is also available at the level of sort of ontological claims by interpreting the neurophysiological activity as metabolizing and processing information. That's relevant, relevant recursive <laughs> realization information, to use John Verveke's frame. So, so you're saying this is, there's no phenomenological experience? I, no, no, not yet. I mean, I'm saying certainly with a dog, there will be. I'm simply saying that but at mind, mind one, but at mind one, we're, we're using this lens. And this is the uh, David Chalmers would call it the easy problems of mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's definitely available from an exterior epistemological vantage point, at least indirectly available. So the neurocognitive functionalist view can be assessed from an external perspective by tracking the activity of brain. So we do an fMRI and we see how, it's, how brain behavior is going. We can slice the brain open and look in terms of its activity. And we can model that activity as a kind of information processing. In fact, that's well, the, um, so. If, uh, if I may, okay, sorry. If I may jump in, I, yep. I do not get the mind one A versus mind one B. So okay. I, I don't understand what you mean when you uh, talk about in, interior epistemology versus uh, exterior uh, epistemology. Uh, I mean, I, I do get that uh, if by interior epistemology, you mean first person uh, experience and That's by, I mean. okay. And so I do not get how mind 1A can be defined as a, uh, a subjective experience. It's not. It's okay. only defined uh, as, uh, so <laughs> mind 1A yeah. is, hey, is just a way of talking about myself through and my activity through what David Chalmers calls the easy problem. It's just a, I'm a robot basically from a mind one perspective, okay? So you can, we can just say, hey, my nervous system is processing information and we're gonna mm -hmm. study it from a third person vantage point. We're not gonna make any, you don't necessarily need to make any subjectivist claims from any mind one vantage point. It's just, it is available through the exterior epistemological view. Okay, and why is it posed uh, under the, uh, the, 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 the group of uh, interior epistemology? I... That's what's not clear. That line, there's a line there that should capture it in relation. I, that's what I need to obviously make clear. It, it should, so there's exterior epistemology. Exterior yeah. epistemology relates to Mind 1A, although it's a little confusing because actually what you can see at neuroinformation processing is a good question. But anyway, that's exterior, overt activities exterior. Mind 3B is exterior. Me justifying yeah. right now, we can do that. Yeah. Mind 2 is uh, interior and mind 3A is interior. Both yeah. of those are interior. So that's what the, the diagram, there's a line in yeah. the ma map of mind diagram that's supposed to block and differentiate. It's not clear. I looked at it. It's just clear to me, but it's not clear to somebody else. So we're okay. in complete agreement. If you're if okay. you're saying mind 1A is available exterior, absolutely. That's what cognitive neuroscience is all about. It's by science. It's from the exterior. Now the behaviorists, yeah. are, the radical behaviors argue that, that, that they don't make a justified ontological or even epistemological move. They argue that mind 1A really, or at least depending on what version of behaviorism you're advocating for. But that's a whole yeah. other. I um, still, I still don't understand why, uh, uh, why there is mi mind A versus well, mind uh, B. Uh, why, uh, sorry, mind mind 1A versus mind 1B. Right. Because in my opinion, it should be just mind mind 1B, and the the only uh, the only mm, layer that can be both interior uh, and exterior is, as you say, mind three, because I can justify 
uh, uh, privately, and I can justify it to the public. So, I, I so in, in so, your so diagram, yeah, uh, I, I, I think mind one should be only in the right uh, part of it. But how could it be exterior and not also interior? That, that, that's where it breaks down for me. Right. Let, let me okay. Put, let me bring up the diagram so we can. Yeah. This, okay. That's better. This subject matter really has a way of becoming complicated very quickly. <laughs> All righty. Let's see. I think uh, Henry gets nine on this day. Here we are. Okay. Okay. So um, this side right here is what yeah. is just going to be available like on a videotape from anybody to watch somebody's activity. Yeah. So this out facing thing is what you would just watch in a video. Okay. So if we just all push upper right. right now, this is going to be all upper right. Yeah. The exterior epistemological view. Okay. Mm -hmm. There is an interior epistemological view that each of us has our own point of view on the world, first person. Okay. That mm -hmm. is our interior epistemological portal that no one else can see directly. And it's just apparent to us. It's we're thrown into the world through our epistemological portal. And this is this whole question about whether or not I, the red you see, I can never see your red directly. In yeah. Okay. So it's now mind 1A is blue here to represent the uh, part of this. Okay. okay. And it's different this is by the way that andrea when i say an american psychology i think you re there really is a fundamental difference like in terms of the paradigms behaviorism yeah. takes a root in america and has its own particular angle on the world that basically european people ignore you know yeah. for, for good reason perhaps uh but watson into skinner and the entire behavioral tradition is very american okay mm -hmm. and this debate is much more salient in the American paradigms than it is in the, and we can talk about why and is that justified or whatever, okay? Yeah. But mind 1B is what the over, there, I think there is a clear distinction at one level. I mean, at one level, okay. the difference between the animal and the environment. And at the other level, it's what's within the nervous system itself. Okay, so one set of activities all within the nervous system. It's a versus another set of activities, which okay. is mediated by the neuromuscular system and actually involves genuine physical change in the environment. So, so uh, I, I think I, I get it. So mind 1A is how a cognitivist mm -hmm. would, would think about the nervous system and mind 1B is how a behaviorist would think 100%. about it. You know? exactly. Okay, I get it. Yep. Okay. okay. Uh, and they're both scientists. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, and then you have this is gray uh, because it represents the interior. So mind two is our subjective conscious experience of being, um, and whatever that is. Okay. Phenomenology, experiential self. We can talk about. Um, I actually now start to use slightly different, uh, or at least differentiate between some of these terms now that I get into it a particular way. And notice this is also gray here. And so this is your private narrator, okay? Um, and then you, then this can, if you let it through the filter, then then that becomes, if you speak it, turn it into writing or speech, then it enters into the system of available for people that have access to that language can then observe it from the outside. So what do you mean by the letter A and B at the end? Right, so it, basically it's the fun, in, in each case, one is on, the, the A's are on the inside, okay? Mm -hmm. But, but one, the mind 1A is inside the animal, but available, okay? From a third person of, experience, yeah. Yes, uh, it, right, exactly. Um, and so B refers to that which is actually in, when we say behavior and mental processes, okay? These are behaviors and these are mental processes in the basic distinction of the way in which uh, modern psychology operates. 
So my so a the a letter uh, means that uh, it is inside our body yep. basically, and the yep. b means that it. It is outside, so that raises uh, um, uh, uh, an interesting question, in my opinion, about mind to be, as yep. you as you know probably, because maybe it should be uh, somehow uh, observable between persons and not okay. just uh, within them. Exactly. So now, what you get, okay, uh, what happens, what I'm going to argue is although that that what I just showed you is is, you know, defensible. So is this version of reality, whereby what happens, especially this is what I'm learning through Tomasello's work. And I mentioned this, yeah. in the, the fourth, I love step, it. Okay, the fourth yeah. step is what happens to our well, first, there's the third step, which is animals getting social. Okay, we see this in the somewhat in birds and definitely in mammals. And when mammals give birth and mothers take care of their kids and you get attachment, uh, harmony, dancing and relation. So now the mother projects herself into the child and then they have a intersubjective space that begins to get opened up. Okay, that's the argument. And then that totally happens um, with humans. And so we yeah. track our subjectivities together pre-verbally and then we create a shared attention and intentional space, okay? Yeah. Which we can then really wonder, hey, should we call this mind to be? Uh, and think about the eyes as the window to the soul and how you share attention yeah. and create dance space. So, yep, 100%. That's so, uh, yeah, that, that resonates uh, a lot with my worldview because there is also uh, an important uh, Italian psychiatrist who is known, I think, all the, in Italy, but, uh, but is, is very important. Uh, his name is Giovanni Liotti, and he, he had a theory about the interpersonality of consciousness. So uh, what you would say is the human uh, interpersonal, uh, so um, the, the, maybe it's better to call it the primate level of uh, consciousness, okay? And he, he thought that he, it is basically uh, he, he, uh, he, it is basically understandable only in uh, interpersonal terms. So yep. it, it it born in the uh, uh, re relational matrix. Totally. Okay. And so uh, so great. Yep. No, that's exactly right. And so that's the cool thing about the system is that then it then identifies this. Hey, here's then. Is there a way that implicit intersubjectively hooks up? And the answer is absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, you know, it's great. And it's, it's like, yep, there's a space right there that opens this up. Dan Siegel in, in the United yeah. States is a big interpersonal mm -hmm. neurobiologist, yeah. um, scientist. He talks very I much know. about this um, basic frame of reference. And so that's, that's the next chapter. So the next chapter that comes after the, um, the consciousness chapter is called mind to be and the relational matrix mm -hmm. yeah and um, if you uh, could speculate you you would say that maybe uh, there is something like a, a dyadic state of consciousness yep where Absolutely. where my perception so when i am not feeling only myself but i'm feeling a dyadic state in i in which i'm feeling me and you so and and so this can be Traced, uh, I don't know uh, when the child is inside the body of the mother, or um, or when I have a deep experience of, of being loved and love. So, and so I, I was wondering um, what what are you, your thoughts about it? If if yeah, do, do so, you I think? Mean, mm -hmm. yeah, so, I mean, no. this is the influence matrix and the idea of a relational adaptational system. Okay, that that grows out of the experiential system, which is just animal environment, but a lot of it's predator getting thirst, get your basic Maslow needs met. But then there's the belonging and esteem needs that yeah. grow out of that at a primate level, pre-verbal, and create the relational heart that is what we do in psychotherapy. It's sort of like yeah, and, and the architecture fundamentally of that uh, with the, the influence matrix tracks the process dimensions, meaning I'm going to now place myself in the relational field in general, in my past and in the present interaction that I have, okay? So now it becomes a self-other social space matrix that is defined 
by me, my perception, and then the recursive feedback loop of myself in relationship to you. So it's completely, that's exactly right. And then it, it says, hey, what we do is we intuitively track the core barometer, which is what's the level of influence, okay? How can yeah. I influence you and you influence me? And then do I feel known and valued by you if you're an important other? I'll track that. And, and, I'll, and so that's the black line. All right, which is the fundamental sort of, and I'm going to regulate that. If I feel attachment wise, the infant is born and then they're tracking the important other, we'll just say the mother to be, you know, generalizable and stereotypical, but fundamentally, yeah. you know, you know, male primates hardly do shit. <laughs> <They don't, laughs> <you know. laughs> it's mothers and others, you know, if you read, you know, before, very <laughs> recently, you know, we actually- Like yeah, many human fathers, yeah. You know, like, well, I mean, you know, it's not accidental, you know. <laughs> yeah, whatever, yeah. Whatever, but so essentially then what happens is the child is born and then the child learns to mirror the mother. So the eyes yeah. look up. And then it's like, do you track me? Do you see me? And mm -hmm. do you know me? Like if I cry, do you know which cries are bitchy, whiny cries that you can kind of say, oh, take a chill. And do you yeah. know which are real fucking cries, which are serious? If you get harmonized and mom seems competent and in tune and attuned, then you get a secure base safe haven that yeah. then creates a cascade of secure attachment flavors that is represented in the... Uh, the influence matrix is the high relational value box, okay? At yeah. a mode level, that's like, okay, you're going to be loved, known, and valued, and protected. Or it's like, if you're ignored, or if you're neglected, or if it's out of tune, or whatever needs the child has and the mother can't meet them for whatever combination of reasons, then there's a threat signal, okay? Now yeah. you're in the low relational value category. You have an insecure attachment. And just exactly as the relationship matrix would map is say, what happens to these kids? Well, they basically they bifurcate originally, which means that some of them go hyper-dependent. Okay, this is John Bowlby's original terms, hyper-dependent. What do they look like? They get clingy, they get bitchy, they do a lot of high attention and high need stuff to stay fused and not be abandoned, but they're also neurotic and cling and whiny, okay? And then the others are dismissive, which are counter-dependent strategies, which yeah. is like, fuck it. I'm not going to get my needs met. So I'm going to now inhibit my dependency needs and become distant and withdrawn and schizoid-like, you know, as yeah. far as you find yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you get the hyper-dependent and counter-dependent strategies that come off low relational value. If they then get, if they also not only are not attuned, but they also get abused, okay, then they're fucked in terms of their disorganized attachment. All right. Mm -hmm. So then now they can't, they have to get love, but they're then going to get injured. So they then split and they go erratically between hyperdependent and counterdependent. And this is actually the architecture of borderline yeah. is this is yeah. the structure, uh, this disorganized attachment structure is hyper defensive and constantly feels in this low, vulnerable, low relational value spot. So I think that lines up wonderfully with the major uh, contribution from psychoanalysis. Yep. Mm -hmm. And 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 uh, even though I uh, like you, maybe I, I still prefer to think about this uh, relational pattern in Bolbian terms because, in my opinion, they, they are more so scientifically based. Right. Yeah. So here's the way I. So here's. I mean, I teach all this. Here's the way I teach this in my class. I, I say, um, so what Freud sees this. I mean, Freud's unbelievably brilliant. He sees yeah. this. Okay. And then what he does, what I argue that he does, is he sees this, and then he does a second level jump, okay? There's level one shit, what I call psychodynamic and subconscious analysis. That's Bowlby and Horney, okay? Karen Horney, John Bowlby, this, I call all the psychodynamic people, Eric Erickson, all right? And then there's the level two, depth psychology, well, one's partially deep, and then deep psychology, okay? Deep psychology then goes from sub, what I prefer to call subconscious dynamic process of the primate level into the archetypal potential of the dark unconscious, mm -hmm. okay? And that's both beautiful and crucial and important and also dark and, and both dark <laughs> at many levels and dark in terms of clarity. It's like, what the fuck is this possibility, okay? Yeah. Okay. And now you really get into artistic interpretations, philosophical interpretations. The science of depth shit is not great because it's hard to see 
and get clear on. They call phenomenology. <laughs> right. It's a, it's just sort of this some phenomenological, intuitive, mythopoetic justification mostly. And that's why I love Alexander Bardem on his list. And, you know, he really is like, it's all philosophy at the socio-analytic kind of, and he does a lot of this interpretation, sees the value of Freud and Jung, but anchors it to philosophy much more than natural science. And I think that that's right. And I think it's, uh, you can play that game. However, subconscious shit, okay, uh, that people care about their relational value, that they care about power, <laughs> love, and freedom, that that motivates their justifications and they try to protect a justified state of being that allows them to have positional influence and value in the world. And then they defend against their interpretations of their reputation and their honor and they feel like shit if they're rejected. Well, I mean, you know, we can, uh, that's in a huge amount of data that says that we do exactly that. The, um, the phenomenological experience still serves to justify, um, although for, not from a naturalistic empirical standard, but it does serve to justify the effectiveness of something like psychodynamic therapy. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Right. So I, I think I don't uh, understand properly your, your, your distinction between uh, the three layers of, of Freud. You, you, you mentioned something like the unconscious, the, the difference between the unconscious and the uh, sub subconscious. And so I, I, I think I didn't understand properly okay. the difference so between these different layers. So, okay. So if you read I, the way, I mean, it takes a little while to see this, but I'll, I'll walk you, I'll walk it through. Um, but the, the, at least the snapshot here, here's the way I teach it. If you read interpretation of dreams and there's mm. a wonderful, uh, called the dream of Irma's injection. Okay. And for and Freud interpreting his own dream. Yeah. So Freud has a dream. Freud has a dream about Irma. Uh, Irma's a patient of his. Okay. Um, and he's in a big hall and he's on a dream and she comes up to him and she's like, oh God, I've got problems. Okay. Um, and I got problems in the back of my throat. All right. Um, and then, so, and I don't remember the exact details, but we review it. Uh, I, I will read it in the next couple of weeks, actually. Um, but basically what happens is some of his authorities that he's in competition well, as he's trying to establish himself, then pop up in the dream and start asking questions. Okay. And then he feels really anxious because he's worried that maybe she has a real uh, disease that he did, that he overlooked because she's not doing well. Okay. And he's worried about the shame and judgment, shame and judgment of these uh, authorities that he will fuck up and feel guilty about. So he feels self-conscious. Okay. Then he asks to look inside and then there, that, that, that he wants to then, then she's got gross going out of her throat and it's like, oh God. There's a real physiological problem that I interpret as a histrionic problem. That's difficult. I'm not going to train that. And we have to then inject it in and into it to make it go away. Okay. So he makes the interpretation that all of this then is based on originally implicit, meaning not originally fully self-conscious, but clearly accessible through reflection, shame about his dominance and guilt and fear of the judgment of the other so it preserves his reputation. Mm -hmm. okay? So that's a one level down, okay? Uh, that's what I call the subconscious interpretation, all right? So then Freud sees that, and then he asks the question, well, where the hell does that come from, okay? Then he goes down deep down into the psychoanalytic dark unconscious, okay? And mm -hmm. then he, he locates the energies in the libidinal love sex energy. So we feel love, but it's really about sex. And it's really about the energy for life. Okay. And then there's also, there's aggression and we want power, but sub underneath that is aggression. And underneath that is a death instinct. And at the fundamental root of all of this is this underlying manifestation of cathected energy that's blocked and redirected through these fundamental sources. Okay. And, and really the sex drive is then looped through the Oedipal complex, all right? And then sublimated and repressed and all of that, okay? So then he says in the dream, he's like, well, here's the, here's the standard interpretation. I, I was anxious about my father-like figure because I cared about status. And then he makes a little footnote. He's like, well, there's a real interpretation, okay? So, and that's actually what he means when, it, when he then drops in and says, there's the real interpretation. For me, what I'm saying is that he's going level two, which is dark unconscious stuff, 
which gets into the cathected energy of his fundamental theory of psychic process, which is this hydraulic core of libidinal energy. Okay. So that's, so you can see, and then what I argue when I teach this course is actually there is the entire psychodynamic shift. Then the, the field shifts into psychoanalytic proper. Okay. The psychoanalytic proper people feel that this is a great discovery, basically. Okay. Young feels like it's a great discovery, but it's wrong. And then he develops his own variant of the collective unconscious yes. and everything else. So he's like, well, the dark, deep unconscious is crucial, but it's different than Freud says. And it's he overemphasizes sex and aggression. Okay. Then well, he takes get, a different etymology there too, right? Because yeah. that's third person. Yeah, no, well, right. So, I mean, he jumps away from Freud and then really Jungian analytic psychology is a, is a cousin of Freudian's de, uh, derived psychology, but it's right. Jungian analytic psychology. Yeah. You know, it's a whole, both of them are debatable. Exactly the nature of their epistemologies is a great point of conversation and debate. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, is Fre Freud thinks he's being hardcore science. I mean, he's a modern empirical scientist, he believes. OK, um, he just doesn't think that it's possible to do experimental research. But the lens of psychoanalysis is an empirical methodological lens to yeah. peer into this process. OK, mm -hmm. that's what he believes. And so really, he thinks he develops a scientific empirical methodology. So he thinks he's a hardcore scientist. Obviously, uh, this philosophy of science judges him differently, most notably Popper, and Popper comes along, yeah. he's got his own stick up his ass and, fa and daddy issues. <laughs> um, but anyway, Popper does his thing and then Freud gets completely jettisoned. And, and of course, and for the, there is a really good critique that the interpretive process of the meaning of the dark unconscious is hard and subjective and, you know, narrative and everything else. I mean, it really is mm -hmm. very difficult uh, to decide what interpretation uh, works, you know, it, it's a very, very difficult process. Um, so you get Melanie Klein and then Jacques Lacan and other people. So there are some people that are like, oh my God, for it's unbelievably brilliant. And the path to the, he outlines the path to the dark unconscious. And that's, that's classic Freudian theory and object relations really goes uh, into that. Uh, from Melanie Klein out Freud's Freud, <laughs> you know, and, and you get all that shit. Okay. But you also get the psychodynamic tradition emerging, which I argue is an important difference. The psychodynamic tradition can be effectively interpreted, in my view, as returning to the subconscious argument. Okay, it's yeah. like, shit, you know, it's really the issue is that people care about, I mean, Adler's the first one. What does Adler move? Adler says it's not about sex and aggression, it's about social inferiority. Yeah, a, you know, second person. It's a blue black line dynamic on the matrix, which is, oh my God, I'm not going to be valued because I'm inferior. And now like Lord Farquhar, I always say you quotes from him and I like it. Now here you have somebody who feels he's short, okay, from Shrek, right? And then who's constantly trying to control and stacking himself up to compensate for his underlying subconscious fear that he is an impotent, okay? That's, the, that's what that whole is about. And that illustrates that. And then- uh, Karen Horn and I picks this up and looks at the basic anxiety to threat and then looks at the typical neuro neurotic strategies of defense, okay? And then how people get, then get channeled into, she originally develops 10 different really interpersonal subconscious strategies that she then identifies as move against. Some people get all pissed off and try to control. Some people move towards, some people fawn and get, and get deferential and say, oh, I'm really sorry so that you keep me around. And then some people get schizoid and hyper autonomous and they say, fuck it, I'm moving away. Okay, those are the big three strategies. Now notice those things directly line up with the matrix, not accidentally, okay? Move against is the blue line. I'm gonna compete with your ass and make a win loss kind of thing. Red line is I'm gonna be dependent, but I'm gonna be affiliative and I'm gonna defer. And then green line is freedom and freedom from influence and control. Okay. Eric Erickson's whole system where he shifts from Freud's psychosexual stages to the psychosocial stages. And finally, John Bowlby. And John Bowlby's a great example. Okay. So he comes along and he's like, holy shit, it actually matters if you hold the kids or not. 
Yeah. <laughs> you lock them in there and they just drop them in, you feed them. But if you don't look at them and you don't respond to them and you don't hold them, you leave them fundamentally disabled in their, de- in their socio-emotional relational developmental structure. I mean, that's the whole point. Yeah. Now, the, and the analytic people, the deep analytical people said, oh no, it's all about fantasy. You're bullshitting, Bulby. You're being too concrete. You're missing the point. And Bobby's like, no, <laughs> you guys are living in fantasy. Let's pay attention to the real relationship. So that's another good example yeah, of psychodynamics. Yeah. So I have two questions. The first is, um, what do the what did you mean when you say that we can describe this mm, deep unconscious state in uh, metopoietic terms? Okay. And 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 the second is uh, related to your model of consciousness of Mm, better of uh, uh, subjective uh, conscious experience and how it emerged in our phylogenesis. And so if this deep unconscious state uh, maybe uh, could correspond to the very first uh, appearance of sentience and so pleasure and pain. And so uh, if we can uh, conceive it basically Uh, if we if we if we want to go to the root of the problem to deep, this deep uh, unconscious uh, we we would find only um, a perpetual shift between uh, pleasure and pain and if if you think this is a good uh, uh, argument about the deep unconscious or or not okay two things there um, so yeah so let's talk about the mythopoetic okay mm. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, basically, the simplest way to think about that, although we have to do some differentiation, is two different languages. The, the, in the academy, we see the two cultures emerge, okay? Like uh, C.P. Snow famously talked about the two cultures in the academy, the sciences and the humanities. Yeah. And he specified that they seem to have these two big clusters um, and what I would say is that they represent two fundamentally different language games, okay? Two different justification systems. Yeah. That they're tasked, really, you can think about them, and the, although this is simplistic, but it carries a lot of pattern, that one is tasked with the question of is science, okay? So science is like, hey, tell us what, the, describe and explain the way the world works from an objective, you know, exterior and, you know, box on Wilbur, okay? And then the other is, hey, wh- how do we make meaning in what ought to be in the world? Okay. Mm-hmm. And if you play the game of, well, meaning and ought, all right, the, the rules of justification are very different. The goals of justification are very different. And the way in which you gain valid contributions and explorations is very different than if you focused on what is. Okay. Yeah. So generally speaking, when I talk about the mythopoetic, I'm also then aligning it with the humanities and all of the arts. Uh, and then, you know, this is going to blend into the social sciences and we can talk all about that relation. But it's basically the idea of a c- constructive, creative expression of what ought to be, what is possible, what, what represents, you know, uh, the exp- artistic expression, what represents the cultural critique, what represents the high culture of the day, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Okay? So to me, what, what psychoanalysis affords is a gold mine of potential to interpret where the root of a lot of these expressions are coming from. Okay. So you're like, where the hell does this come from? <laughs> and Freud opens up an angle. And of course, Freud gets so much more really uh, influence in the humanities argue precisely because it's this loose quasi scientific explanation yeah. that then yeah. affords us lenses to see stuff and to express stuff in, in, in radically new ways. I mean, the Freud was definitely, although of course people had talked about, you know, the difference between what we are rationally aware of and what we aren't. I mean, back in Ben Franklin's day, he's talking about some of these things and several other people, but Freud nails it in a particular way of specificity And he gives really rise what his fundamental, his analysis of what the analyst would say, the discovery of the unconscious that Freud was able to see through the shadows and detect what the architecture was. You know, that's a debatable claim. I think he saw some beautiful things and I think then he overshot 
you know, the definitive nature with which he said he saw it. And then, yeah. you, know, you know, it's a, it's a lot more debatable and interpretable than Freud wanted it to be. Um, but it doesn't mean it wasn't brilliant and, and novel and opened up lots of artistic uh, potential. Um, so that's what I mean in terms of it really, it's a beautiful thing to connect the mythopoetic, okay, to. It also is, allows us to, you know, create, see the space between psychosocial inquiry, you know, sort of philosophy, metapsychology, the bridge between the sciences and humanities. There are a lot of things that are going to have a, you know, an in-between kind of space. There'd be many good reasons why something might be in between. I see it in that regard. And I, and so, but I see it as being very useful and important. Uh, I mean, it, I think Freud's actually warrants more attention than he gets in empirical psychology. Um, and I think these are really, the question is how to hold it. Um, and how to, with, you know, some degree of sophistication, so. Okay, I get it. So maybe Freud uh, would have called the pleasure Eros and the, um, oh, totally. and the pain Thanatos. And yeah, so, 100%. Yeah, you so, can totally immediate. The, the thing yeah. lines up. I mean, you know, what is he talking mm -hmm. about? Well, pleasure is a release of energy, <laughs> okay? Now he's too, being too concrete with a hydraulic bottle. But if you do behavioral investment, it's a calculated release of energy of work effort relative to entropy, neg entropy kind of processes. So, okay, you add information theory to it and all of a sudden the whole thing starts to, you know, and then pain is sort of, Freud's pr approach to pain is, is actually quite weird. He doesn't have a nearly as good theory of pain. Um, and I think that that's, you know, we can talk a little bit about that. But anyway, but the idea that there are pleasure pain energies at the root of the id um, and, and then the shadow stuff in relationship to that, how to trace what the body is feeling through approach and avoid in signals. I mean, that's both what trauma people do. And that's exactly what this theory says we should do that, that mm. approach felt experiences in the body, pleasure, pain, they get stored in particular kinds of ways that interface is right there. Um, so I certainly will want to shine an intuitive felt good, bad approach, avoid sense at the base of our um, subjective experience in yep. our embodied way of feeling and being in the world. So I, I think I would say that I'm a bit skeptical about the mythopoietic uh, narrative about the ultimate uh, unit of, uh, uh, of consciousness. Uh, not because I'm not a fan of art or, of, or humanities. I mean, I am a musician. I do love art and everything. But I think that uh, my, my, concern with, my concern with it is that uh, there is no anchor. I mean, I, I can have my narrative, you can have your narrative, and there is no objective uh, parameter that can uh, decide uh, that can decide if my narrative is better than yours. And so that uh, irritates me a bit, but I, <laughs> I yeah, will stop no, here. I mean, this is, you know, we can, uh, yeah. Uh, to me, what we want is more, uh, I'm a coherentist, consilient seeker, you know. I mm -hmm. want to have um, much better appropriate dynamic dialectical relation, say, between the sciences and humanities yeah. in, in interplay. In fact, the whole point of the two cultures argument was, oh my God, we have now bifurcated these two language systems um, and they don't speak to each other at all. And they're getting further and further yeah. apart in relationship yeah. to what they see as important and value. And, you know, that's actually, you know, that's all part of the crisis of modernity from my vantage point, which then gives rise to a fragmented pluralism of where we can't speak any shared language. Um, and, uh, you know, as uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger talked about it. And when we did the Stoa thing, he was like, well, what's our base reality? Well, that's a good question. And we definitely, in my opinion, you want scientific epistemology to be brought to bear and start saying, well, what is base reality? That's our best tools, um, or at least, well, at least aspects of base reality are, uh, you know, so anyway, let's. So I have a question here, this kind of, I don't know how I organized this, but uh, so I'm seeing like going back to conscious, subconscious, unconscious, they're all according to like the joint points. So you, you talked earlier about they're stratified, these different levels. Yep. 
Now they're stratified according to levels of what you call mostly behavioral complexity, but at least complexity, right? Mm -hmm. So if that's so, then consciousness itself is a higher level of complexity that is dependent on the lower level um, that gives rise to it being the nervous system. Mm -hmm. so that's what um, yep. behavioral investment theory says. Yep. So how is it that if the nervous system essentially created consciousness then mm -hmm. it created the unconscious and the subconscious so what might i think maybe you actually just answered this then is is how the nervous system differentially oriented aspects of consciousness such that they would be unconscious subconscious and fully aware conscious mm -hmm. that fits mm -hmm. oh cool uh, you know, another way of saying it is, is this. At first, the, the nervous system is all dark. Okay? It, it's, a, it's a subjective processing system in an information way, like a cell, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the, a, a light of consciousness comes on. And what do you mean by the light? Well, we can refer to this when we sleep. Okay? You're con you become unconscious at a deep sleep. Mm -hmm. okay? so the, so, but your brain still is is processing information big time. Okay. So yeah. that's not, it's creating non-conscious processing information. At first, the whole thing's non-conscious. Okay. But then what we're saying is that there is a way in which the, the brain begins to coordinate around a centralized broadcast system. Okay. That basically becomes the, like on a stage, the, the analogy is you have to be careful with this, but I'm, I like this a lot. This is global neuronal workspace. The idea is, is that there's like a, the whole system is like a stage. And then there is a way in which you can put items underneath a spotlight that serves as a broadcast function. Okay. To mm -hmm. the, so that the, so that it becomes, it gives access to all of the neurocognitive parts of the system. So they get coordinated around it. Is this like the self-reflection, self-recursive ability? Well, the way it happens, I believe, is this, okay? Before, but but it depends on what you mean by self here, because I'd have to be specifying what uh, this is. I guess at, at this level of, of life, if we're just talking about like a nervous system, um, not anything advanced. Um. Well, where, where are you going with it? Okay, so uh, I think the for me, I like the, I like to tell the evolutionary natural ontology story. I did that in the blog uh, a little bit. This is what I'm trying to do. So, so I, I think it's easiest to put it together like building blocks across evolution. Okay, that's how I. Yeah. So here's the best story that I'm detecting. Okay, you start off with jellyfish. Okay, which is and and indeed you the argument now maybe is is that there. Are, the, the kinds of jellyfish have sensory detectors that are just detecting light so that it's checking circadian rhythm, knows basically where the light's coming. And then it has an also separate motor system, okay, um, that then just gets activated depending on what sort of the chemical arrangement that it's in, all right? And then it will, move, the motivation, motivation, <laughs> the movement <laughs> will just simply be triggered by the chemia, chemical input. But there really is a distinction between the long-term sensory detectors, which are just in this argument, light-based. So you have little light-based uh, electromagnetic detectors that are really just deciding what the circadian rhythm and the di diurnal nocturnal state is and whether or not there may be a shadow of a predator, which then activates. But then what, these, what happens is, is that when you shift into a bilateral plan, okay, this is a movement from a jellyfish into a planaria. So a planaria is a little flatworm that has then, that has bilateral, okay, which basically means now it moves in a coordinated direction. It has a head, all right, and a tail and a bilateral symmetry. What happens there is then that you require much more directed control and guidance. And as these things migrate in a particular way, the sensory system hooks up to the motor system, okay? And now you start to get a centralized control sensory motor system, okay? Which at this stage is still 
not enough for consciousness, according to the best guess. Right. So there's no self or experience of self, but is there still, that's a feedback loop that you're there's describing? Oh, absolutely. The, the, okay. the nervous yeah. system is always, it creates a semantic form of processing. It's like, oh, that's a, here's a chemio form, chemical form. Here's a light form. Here's a mechanical form of the, of, I got to get around. Of course, not I, but right, know, right. the system is a cybernetic control system. And we have very simple maps of cybernetic control or circular feedback, like a thermostat. You just set a point and it wants to be at a particular temperature, quote unquote wants. And if it measures the temperature to be under, you add cold air. And if it measures it to be over then, uh, or if it's under, you add heat, you, you know, that very, so there's very simple non-conscious regulatory structures. And the argument is that that's the nervous system then becomes an information processing computational control center at this point, right. okay? Then what happens, so this is about 600 million years ago, the way, this is what animals look like 600 million years ago, little planaria-like worms, okay? Then there's the Cambrian explosion. Cambrian explosion 550 million years ago to 500 million years ago, 520, whatever. It's a 30 million year period, but in geologic time, it's very, very active. And by the end of it, you have crustacean-like creatures, okay? Crustacean-like uh, creatures, anthropod-like, which means they have segmented bodies, legs, eyes, okay? And other detections, and then they move around engage in predator prey relations with each other okay so now now you're communicating and now you're engaged in a really dynamic feedback loop yeah okay and john verbeke would call this they now have to participate as whole agents in a much more successful a sophisticated way in a dynamic relationship to another agent okay that's now engaged in prey predator relation i see okay yeah so how does it do this? Well, what happens is, is that there becomes a centralized system of three different, that has three components, which I call the PME relation, okay? The one component is the organization uh, of the exterior senses to then get you wired together to create a joint uh, unified map of some sort of my sight, my smell, my sound, and what other touch sensors that I might have, okay? So now I'm gonna get a multi-sensory map of the external world, and that all gets actually, there's, that gets yoked and centralized together. And like the, in, in the vision systems get yoked together in a thing called the optic tectum, okay? In like insects and shit, okay? So, so there's that set of exterior detectors and then there's a whole nother set of interior homeostatic regulators, or really allostatic regulators. Okay. Allostatic regulators are teching the body position and the structural organization and the state of your cells and things like, are you hungry or what needs do you have in relation? Okay. This is called interiorception. Interiorception basically then is the way the brain is tracking the structural organization of where the, how things are. So it's what is out here and how am I in here? <laughs> okay. Right. And that's the M in my frame is the mo motive. Okay. Because what it says is, it's like, Hey, is everything okay? Or are things not going so well? And what does that mean about what you need? So when you, then what happens is the system has got to then judge the interrelationship between the exterior state of affairs and the interior state of affairs. It has to relate the exterior perception to the interior motive state. The discrepancy then activates the energizes the motion that you then release that says, okay, so let's say I'm kind of injured and vulnerable. I detect a shadow that might be a predator. Okay. That then activates a avoidance state, right. which basically will then release a freeze state to detect and then if I can feel like I can escape, now I can race away. And the more distance I get from that shadow, the more better I will feel. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's the intersection of the perception of exterior, the regulation of interior, and the energized motion that I am saying is consciousness at the base. This is called the base of sentience. 
is because yeah. it yokes together yeah. these three domains, okay? And we can identify pleasure and pain as broadcast functions that yoke yeah. together what you see, how you feel, and what you're doing as to whether or not it's going well or not going well. So you don't equate the appearance of brain with the appearance of consciousness, right? So there were brain without consciousness. Yeah, yeah uh, right. Pr the, this is, uh, so you get a brain and then the brain's got to have a little bit more. A planaria brain is too simplistic. They have 302 neurons generally, okay? They don't integrate at the same level and the hierarchical layering is not generally, it's a big debate as to whether the high, we don't know what causes sentient experience still. So this is a big, you know, we're still doing lots of inference based on models pieced together. But the, to me, the, the, um, the people that do the best work in this, or, or at least make a very convincing case that there is early models that start here. Okay. Um, and that's the, that, and the best, I mean, this just came out in 2020, uh -huh. this evolution of the sensitive soul. And this whole book argues essentially that case and what they're arguing is what that does when they, what they say is it's free, it, it allows the system to ascribe motivational value, okay, to objects and events, meaning tag it with pleasure and pain, okay? So now essentially it's like, oh, here's this, here's this cluster of what is, how I'm feeling and what I'm doing that gets yeah. yoked together. Now you tag, that's pleasure and that's pain. And what that does is it then allows a dynamic participatory interactive feedback loop, okay? That is non-reflexive, all right? And is capable of behavioral selective learning. The law of effect, but as it goes right back to yeah. Dyke's fundamental law of effect. Yeah, and what I find very uh, mind-blowing is that uh, as you wrote in, in your book, in, in your in progress book, the main intuition about the very first appearance of what we call mind is probably associated with movement. Mm -hmm. And that was basically what uh, Aristotle said in totally. The Anima. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah uh, and so that kind of uh, alienation between modern neuroscience and uh, animal be behaviorism and uh, ancient Greek philosophy is, 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 is great, yeah. That's right, he, and by the way, they're making that point exactly in this book. The evolution of the sensitive soul is a direct reference to Aristotle. I mean, that's yeah. what it is, uh, which is the vegetative soul, okay, is, is the nutrients. Of course, he didn't know about cells, but he knew about plants uh, and, and fungi. But there's the nutritive rep reproductive process of plants, but there's a sensory motor difference. Uh, they're much more motor sensory based animals and the sen what he called the sensitive soul, which is the second layer, which is exactly what mental evolution is on the unified theory. All of that yeah. lines up directly. Uh, and I think that's why I'm very uh, disappointed in the modern science because uh, before the scientific revolution, before the Leibman gap, as you would label it, uh, scientist and philosopher used to be the same thing. I mean, you, 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 you used to be a natural philosopher. So that, that, that means that you, you can uh, inquire both ethics and yeah. physic, physics and metaphysics and psychology, as for example, uh, Aristotle did. Of course. And, uh, and, and, and for me, uh, your, your, one of your great uh, uh, virtue is, is that you, you are doing something very similar something that mm, nobody's doing or, or at least very few people is doing in the in the contemporary times so they are all, all the scientists they uh, uh, they think they do not care about ethics and, and metaphysics but they actually uh, I think the, um, there is a, a, a beautiful quote by Searle that is something like uh, if you uh, don't pay attention to philosophy, uh, you you will uh, you you will do philosophical errors. Totally. Yeah, and and I think that's the the main the main uh, shortage of modern scientific view, as you as you know. And yeah. Right. Well, uh, so thank you for that, and that, <laughs> I I really do think this needs to be emphasized. I mean, this uh, people we need to be aware. Okay. So right. So natural philosophy. <laughs> that's what it used to be called. I mean, science yeah. used to be called natural philosophy. Uh, you know, the church 
is totally dominant. Everybody believes in the Christian version of reality, but there is this physical world out there. And they send, you know, natural philosophy out, and then science originally is natural philosophy. Um, yeah. Galileo, so this is super important to know. So unfortunately, though, at the time of, of the finding of modern empirical natural science, of which Galileo is the father, Okay, so he's the father. Yeah. Most people consider him the father of science. What do they mean by science? A modernist empirical natural science view of the world. Yeah. Galileo is, is both brilliant, but he also overshoots, as is so often the case. So he's brilliant in the sense that he, he hates what's going on at the time, is irresponsible, yeah. circular, pure metaphysics. Okay, they're taking yeah. Aristotle, they're putting him on drugs, and they're like, oh my God. I'm seeing <laughs> shit, okay, and and they're doing all yeah. this scholarship, but actually, historic historical analysis would critique them as being unbelievably circular and vacuous and lame. <laughs> yeah, and, and so yeah. Galileo sees them as circular, vacuous, and lame, and he's like, "This is all bullshit," and and he makes the empirical move. Okay, yeah. by that he means I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of metaphysics and and really translate my the definitional system into math and of and measurement of observation that's what it becomes okay um, and he's trying to do everything he can do to get rid of aristotle's metaphysics yeah and what you see in aristotle's metaphysics the simplest way for us to understand it in my opinion this this process is that there are four modes of explanation for why shit why things happen for 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 aristotle Okay. And he thought all things could use these modes of explanation. And one was substance. Okay. Uh, and he means it a little differently, but, but what's, what's the stuff made of? Okay. Yeah. Um, then there is the efficient cause. So there's a substance cause, there's efficient cause, which basically is the kinetic cause. What is the energy yeah. that went into it to make it happen? Okay. Then there's the formal Fun. cause. Okay? Yeah. Like it has a particular, this cup is a cup because it carries water. It's got a form, okay? And, and then the final. The final, yeah. which is the reason that it's a cup is because we wanted it to be a cup, okay? Yeah. And uh, Aristotle's stuff works great for things like cups, okay? But he thought it worked for everything, including things like rocks, all right? Like the, mm -hmm. the final cause of a rock was that it wanted to get to, rocks wanted to go down, Okay, and air wants to go up. And so the reason the rock moves towards the down, what it's trying to do is find its proper place in nature. The telos of the rock is to move down. That's its final causation, which is really to the center of the earth versus air, which goes away from the earth. So we created this different taxonomy of different kinds of physical things and, and argued that the reason they did what they did in part was because their form and their final causation Okay. Well, Galileo thinks that's bullshit, and Galileo's generally right for the material dimension of existence. Okay. When you do matter in motion, you're left with two of Aristotle's four explanations. You're basically left with there's a substance and there's a kinetic causation. That's all you need for empirical matter in motion. You do not need to say that the rock wanted to get to the bottom. Okay. That becomes superfluous. And then Galileo thus rejects formal and final causation as decent explanatory modes, justified explanatory modes for accounting for what happened. And it turns out, generally speaking, that's actually reasonable to do for the material dimension of complexity. Okay. And since Newtonian physics became the dominant thing that we started to equate science with, then basically science decided that the only legitimate things that were used to describe and explain why should happen were kinetic and substance causation. And they got rid of formal and final causation. Okay? To the point where you're now looking at the living and mental world to trying to reduce them to just substance and kinetic causation, which turns out to be a huge metaphysical error. Okay? Um, and, and now I think that the philosophy is crystal clear on this point. Um, uh, but what we need, what is the, why does this matter? It's because science then adopts an overly empiricist language system 
that is inadequate metaphysics for life, mind, and culture. That's what happens. So the scientist doesn't have a good language system. And as a function of that, they also get arrogant about what they're capable of doing. They jettison philosophy and in jettison metaphysics. And you know now we actually don't know how to talk about mind and matter. And we don't have the philosophical tools to come back and reflect on shit like ontology, epistemology, and all that. Yeah. And we can just try to reduce it to experimentation and, and data. And that's why psychology has been clapping with one goddamn hand now uh, for the basically last hundred years. Yeah. Basically a replication of the same problem. Now Galileo's categories aren't sufficient for, uh, I guess, exploring the nature of, of, of humankind or of life. Right. Uh, even life. In fact, you can go on to... Uh, um, uh, Sean Carroll's Mindscape podcast. Yeah. Okay, I recommend it. He's a very he's a naturalist that's waking up. So he's a physicist like who's Carroll. also a naturalist who's also like shit. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of philosophical questions we physicists don't have good answers to. So he mm. they, does the big picture. He just had David Haig on. Okay, David Haig's a Harvard biologist who talks about purpose and meaning in biology. Okay. And, his, and he says, hey, a lot of my traditionalist colleagues bitch at me for using the term purpose. And he's like, yes, it's true that a natural science account of evolution writ large is not intelligent design purpose there. But guys, listen, you can just see that natural evolutionary processes generate things that have purpose. And we need purpose as a descriptive category for what the fuck animals are doing and, and plants are doing. I mean, yeah. you know, you have, you know, so you can see him in in modernist systems. You have an, uh, you have a relatively sophisticated biologist going, God, you know, we really handcuffed ourselves in the way we talk about biology, and that's actually happening everywhere. All the emergent philosophy stuff, emergent naturalist philosophy stuff, is basically waking up and making this point. And you're seeing now emergence and complexity and chaos thinking and complex adaptive yeah. dynamics everywhere because people are actually like, Yep, we screwed this up. And physical reductionism is clearly inadequate, philosophically inadequate to what we're trying to do. Uh, yeah. The level of lifeline and culture. So I'll, I'll jump in and, and say that there are some philosopher, uh, European philosopher like Tumela, uh, who is Estonian, and uh, he basically reframes uh, Aristotle's four causes in contemporary terms. So he, he labels the material cause as parts, so what components uh, compose a whole, and the uh, formal cause as the emergent whole, okay. okay? Yep. And so the efficient cause as simply the efficient cause because it's the, uh, uh, the, um, is the uh, instantiation of, co of causality as we uh, commonly think about. Yep. And finally, um, and finally, the so uh, par, uh, material uh, material uh, form uh, and, and 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 the last cause in term of so the final cause in terms of uh, development. Okay. Interesting. So so I think that uh, with this reframing, maybe we can apply also the uh, Aristotle four causes in yep. in physical terms, but the, this. These are yeah, yeah no uh, major of, major concern. Yeah, he, here's the point that I think we that I'm a, that I learned, and I think it's just now indisputable. So, physicists tried to get rid of metaphysics, okay, and they tried to reduce metaphysics to empiricism, and that yeah. language game tried to do that, and they fucked it up, okay. And there's nothing more obvious when you look at the struggles that they had with quantum mechanics and general relativity. You know, or first with Newton, what is gravity and how do you have force acting at a distance with nothing in between? That was a huge metaphysical question they didn't really answer. And then massive metaphysical questions emerge when you go into quantum mechanics and general relativity. What is space? What is time? What's an object? What's a particle? How the hell do we understand all this? You know, and these are uh, unbelievably, um, you know, you don't escape these questions. Uh, right. you, have a, you have to have a descriptive metaphysics of the concepts and categories you're applying and at least reflect on them. And you cannot reduce that to experimentation. You have that, to have that, you know, yeah. that, that reflective aspects of that. So that's, that's very funny because our ontology uh, directly stems from physics. Mm -hmm. Totally. So they are not interested in metaphysics, but our metaphysics 
stems from physics. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Right. So ontology cannot be reduced via epistemology, the ontic. Right. Okay. Well, all right. So let's, yeah, let's spend a little time with this because this is a... Um, That's Bascar's way of, of describing it kind of, right? Right. That, so he uses a slightly different possible. set of terminologies, but mine lines up, lines up very directly. Okay. Um, so for me, right. So you have philosophy, which is this question about what is knowledge, what are its components? The first thing underneath philosophy is metaphysics, which are okay. We're going to then have your concepts and categories. So metaphysics are the concepts and categories that we're going to divide things up and be reflective about that. Okay. Then underneath metaphysics, um, I want to then say, hey, I want to employ the idea of, well, the parts of a theory of knowledge, okay, are going to be the following. Uh, if you go from Plato, not what constitutes knowledge, but the parts that make up a theory of knowledge are, you have some representational belief thing, that's the knower doing something, that's mapping some aspect of the known, okay, and then you analyze the relationship to the level of its justification. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have the you have a knower knowing something about the known, and then it's either justified or not, depending. So those are the three dynamic relationships between okay, if we're going to talk about knowledge, you have a knower knowing about something and it's justified or not in some way. Like the person checking the map against the territory. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And Eris, uh, Plato defined, did this early, this is the first really systematic analysis of epistemology, which is theory of what is knowledge, and argued that n true knowledge was justified true belief, okay? And what he meant by that is there's a state of affairs, the belief is tr truly captures that state of affairs, and you're justified in having the beliefs that you have. So if you have, if you meet these three criteria, there's a state of affairs, your belief that corresponds to the state of affairs, and you're justified in making that assertion. That intersection gives rise to a proper conception of what true knowledge is that's justified knowledge or a, a adequate epistemology, which is justified true belief. That, now, it turns out that the philosophy in the 1950s broke that up in an analytic, sophisticated way and said, mm, there are exceptions to this rule, and so it's not a perfect frame, but it lasted for 2,000 years, and it's a damn good frame, okay? Um, so justified true belief. What my point is, is yeah, let's just attend to the idea that you have to have some knower representing something at some level. It's a modeling, representing, mapping, okay, of some other thing out here, and then there's some relationship between that process. That's Those are the three ingredients to knowledge, Okay. Um, so you have to have those at a minimum. And what I want to say is, is that what the tree of knowledge shows is if you have that as a minimum, you then impute, you can clearly represent the relationship of reality. So what, what is trying to be mapped, the territory, okay? Right. And then the maps that are doing it, whereby science, the cluster of scientific knowledge represents the organization of maps, mm -hmm. okay, that are then mapping the reality and it, and the tree of knowledge then represents the reality okay as it it, it this is an ontological representational claim of the ontic reality <laughs> okay right um, wait, sorry but uh, ba basically ontology then becomes the claims about reality right that's my beliefs about it and epistemology is like how do i know and make those claims and think those are better claims than other claims that might be made okay so then onto epistemology becomes the ontological claims that are then justified through methodological process. Yeah. Like the whole frame of reference, really. Mm -hmm. Right. What's your frame? What are you claiming? And how do you claim it? So then this becomes your, your system at propositional level. Then it becomes a justification system that makes ontological claims about what is that then is networked through a method of justification. Okay. Right. Yeah. So now if what we say what science is, well, science, there's the scientific method, okay, which is its epistemological process and set of assumptions, and then the scientific claims, which are the ontology. And then the question is, to what extent it's true, is that it's, well, what is it? Is it a good map model representation of whatever reality happens to be? Okay. 
Roy Bashkar called this the he called the re separate reality the intransitive ontology. Okay, he called it the intransitive. I call it the ontic reality. So he called it the intransitive. I call it the ontic reality. And then I call what he called the transitive ontology, which is our scientific models. I just call our common ontology, which is just, hey, these are the beliefs that we have about reality. That, you know, so I believe that there's that we can map that out here. There are hydrogen atoms, and I believe those hydrogen atoms generally consist of a proton and an electron, and that that represents and maps something. So I have an ontology of the ontic reality. Okay. Sure. That then, then okay. the scientific method then is epistemological justification that that argues why am I legitimate? And there you have the the network. So, so does, does the tradition well, end up with sort of pre pre empiricism? Say that I missed one of your words there. So could you just repeat? Does it? does the justification does it line up with pre empiricism? when it comes to, to a framework and studying a framework. Yeah, so, okay, well, pre-empir, you mean before the scientific revolution? You mean pre-empiricism or? I, I mean, in, in terms of, um, I'm trying to remember it from, from the third chapter of your book, where basically you decide what you want to study, then you, you like you start with the theory but okay. that theory is is not based on empirical findings. Right. Well, well, well okay, so pr the pre-empirical questions are descriptive metaphysical questions. Right. Okay. So which is basically like, or at the very least, what are my concepts and categories? Okay. So I need mm -hmm. to be reflective about that. Now you can then start to embark on empirical stuff and then change those. But yes, the de way in which you uh, align your concepts and categories can be thought of as pre-empirical. And that is, in fact, a justification. Oh, it's, well, for me, all propositional knowledge systems okay, right. are properly thought of as justification systems. Okay. Right? There are different kinds of justification systems. All right. They play by different language games. That's actually what I was asking. Are you talking about, like, for me, modern empirical natural science is a new kind of justification system. Sure. Okay? Uh, and following Roy Bashkar, it's a justification system that does make transcendent realist claims about reality okay mm -hmm. that is means that we get more of an objective view of reality than before modern science okay it, it, it has some talent in uh, in factoring out our biases and yielding a more objective now how objective it is you know i have my alien test um so my alien test is you know if some alien shows up that has intelligence will they have an atomic theory of matter Will they know about the Big Bang? Um, if they do, then we've really arguably achieved a transcendent realist ontology. Yeah. Right? That, that, if they don't, then you get more into a Kantian phenomenological, um, we are trapped by our epistemology more. Um, and so it's a great, that's a, that's a to be determined uh, question you can certainly so argue. But anyway. I, I have two questions about uh, Platon's and Basque. Uh, Bashkar's on the epistemology uh, are overlapping with Wilbur's one, mm -hmm. and also I have some problems in the with the with with the Wilbur's uh, quadrant of epistemology. Right. Um, I mean, I I do get the dialectics between the interior and the exterior. Yep. I, but I do, I do not get the dialectics between the collective and the individual. And yep. I do not know if we can, when, you talk, when we talk about epistemology, if we can talk about some sort of natural uh, categories based in uh, cognitive science. I mean, mm -hmm. there is a, a subjective phenom phenomenological point of view and, the, and then there is a third person experience. Or if the only natural point of view is the uh, subjective mm. and all the other are uh, in, in somehow um, socially constructed so i think we we could say this because uh, the institution of science is uh, an intersubjective enterprise sure. epi epistemological enterprise and so i've been arguing this with greg since i met him 
<laughs> and so, and so uh, getting back to, to Wilbur's uh, quadrant, okay. can, we, can we say that there is also uh, an um, a interior collective, so we, and can we say there is also an exterior collective, so a system, a whole, or they are just conceptual uh, artifacts? I think. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, so, a couple things. I mean, I, my my opinion about this is that Wilbur's got a brilliant heuristic here. It's mm -hmm. a very very powerful uh, heuristic, and there are definitely differences, useful differences, to be thinking in terms of the individual level of analysis versus collective on both the interior and exterior. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I also think that if you bring your critical eye to it, the cleanliness or the precision or the utility of the subjective versus first and third person point of view is very powerful. I, I really think that you have to have access to that distinction. Yeah. Okay? I think that the cleanness of the individual to collective is, much, is less clean. Yeah. Right? They were less uh, crisp. Uh, the lines there vary um, and are not as definitively separate. I think it's a useful distinction, um, but the category of the distinction is not as precise. Well, that's why he calls it intersubjective, which mm -hmm. I mean, equally true is interobjective. Right, so his term for both, for so there's the individual subjective, then there's the intersubjective, then there's interobjective and objective. Those are the four terms that he uses for the categories. Um, I, the uh, and they're, uh, they are very different. I mean, so you can definitely see different epistemological. So, so just so we can empathize with them. So the upper left is anchored to pheno perspectival phenomenology. That's so that's, that's you know, each of our epistemological portals at the level of um, mind two, basically. I mean, mind two mm -hmm. is the, that's what really grounds the upper left. Or Wilbur, that's the way I would interpret it. It's a mind to yeah. everybody has an epistemological position. And that has a very, very compelling argument because what happens at mind two is the ontic reality and onto epistemology actually collapse at that moment mm -hmm. in a particular way. Yep. Okay? In other words, I what 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 Rene Descartes is getting at when he says, I think therefore I am, one way of referring this is just, I am. I mean, whether I'm in a fucking matrix or not, I still have my thinking and there's no way that that could be false even because the ontic reality of my subjective experience is what i say it is if i see red if i am being red that's there's no other way that that could be wrong you can't uh, escape yourself you can't escape that that's not like i could be no you're mistaken greg i might be mistaken about some other reference point but i can't be mistaken about that experience per se that's now contained it's a beautiful that's why I think the Eastern tradition call this the absolute. I mean, you know, this mm -hmm. is like, boom, it's a collapse of, uh, of this. And, and it does ground knowledge in a particular way. It's it, at the same time, depending on what you then say, well, you ground knowledge in solipsism. That's the, that's the Western objectivist yeah. critique of it. That's, that's well. some it's, retro romantic bullshit. You know, it's like, yeah, it's like, what the, so, <laughs> you know, I don't give a shit about what you subjectively know and experience, you know, you could be masturbating in a tree in your dream. I mean, it just doesn't matter uh, <laughs> in relationship to, to the, we want to feel like what, uh, to use Dan Spock, there's base reality out here. And that's actually what we better be coordinated on, not what's inside your head. So that's a, that, so, but we can say that perspectival phenomenological grounding of being, which many Eastern traditions have, is an upper left position, and, and it grounds it in perspectival phenomenology. Now, what then is the lower left position? The lower left position is the critical theory, social constructionist view, and hermeneutic view. We get together, and this is much more of a Mike Muscolo view, too. Mm -hmm. okay? um, mm -hmm. And, and the answer, his answer is kind of what we talked about at the beginning of this thing. It's like, well, you're born into a relational world. You get socialized into a relation. Your whole conception is relationally bound and grounded in a development. And by the time you're even saying your phenomenology is X, it's actually already emergent in a relational world that has a developmental history that's going to constrain it 
Let's be aware of a developmental relational constructivist view and let's start there. There's a we space that we actually are all really grounded in, okay? A developmental we space. That's, that's the relational constructivist view that I would characterize Mike Mascolo as. There's mm -hmm. then the more shared um, social constructive Berger and Luckman view, the social construction of reality. Yeah. Right? Which is, hey, I got born as an American white <clears throat> upper middle class. I get my white privilege. There's a lot of the critical race theory and feminist theories, the large scale systems of justification that are normative and located in socio-historical space, give you your identity, put you in macro level social space. And yeah. that's where all the language games are being played. And knowledge yeah. is a function of socially constructed language games. Yeah. And so that's the lower left epistemological quadrant. Um, you shift to the other side and you get objectivist views, which are stepping outside of and looking at. The one is the reductive, generally reductive view. The upper right is the reductive view that says, hey, I'm going to hone in on the computationally reducible parts because these are the fundamental, what's fundamentally real is these parts. And if I can decode them, the fractal of each one of these parts is what gives rise to the whole. So I want to isolate, reduce the part and then macro explode from the isolated that to see the whole. So that's a reductive analysis of the behavioral of the individual unit and then move out from there. So you go down and then move out. And then I just had Nora Bateson on, on Monday. So, you know, Gregory Bateson, founder of systems theory is no, you, you look at the nested layers of everything across all levels of social into and physical ecological systems theory and each one of those little parts is defined by that context. You never lose sight of it. Yes, we can't get as much specificity on this, but this is what nature is. And we're going to see it from a holistic systems view. I mean, those are uh, the beauty of Wilbur's integrated methodological pluralism is that those definitely are traditional, you know, well-grounded traditional paradigms. We can talk about <laughs> paradigms and they clearly can be uh, differentiated into core epistemological frames or boxes. Um, and then you see this meta epistemological system. And you're like, well, shit. Yeah. Each of these create se sessions, each try to engage in frame control from a particular kind of set of assumptions. Each have the primary metaphysical concepts and categories that they're saying to be central. Um, and this, this cluster of four simple categories allows you to create a taxonomy of epistemological frames. That's really beautiful and powerful as far as I'm yeah, so I, I think also that we can say that uh, framed in this way, we can say uh, the upper left quadrant as the uh, as a pre-modern narrative, mm -hmm. and and then we go to the post-modern. So everything is is socially constructed, and then we go to the uh, the reductionistic view that that, that sees that uh, everything is just a, a bunch of chemicals, and then we we go to the meta meta modern view. Everything is connected. Uh, everything. Your mic's breaking up. Yeah, I, I lost it. Your mic was getting a lot of static. Ah, uh, okay. Last, uh, so uh, I, I, I think I heard. Here's what I heard. Um, uh, the pre, the pre, so the tr there's a traditional, what I pre prefer to call is the, the, the pre-modern is this traditional formal view. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, like in, in, in the West, then in West European, that's Christianity. It's a Greco Roman Christianity justification system. Um, you put it in the upper left. I, I, I would hesitate a little bit there. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, it's probably more lower left because it's a little bit, it, the, the Christian worldview is a little bit different. Okay. It's, it's not a formal, uh, it's, it's, it derives its epistemological justification. I mean, justification in the Christian church, yes, in part could be sort of, okay, there's a phenomenological faith that fundamentally, but it also is a, an awareness, you know, it's grounded in a tradition, revelation, and authority, okay? Um, and it's, it's a really, actually a really interesting question. What is the epistemology of the Catholic church um, <laughs> I, I well, don't know that it science. Fits. Uh, what's that? Their religion is their science, so they don't yeah. really have a true upper right according to modernism. 
because yeah, I mean, I, 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 it, it's a it's a revelation based uh, uh, mm -hmm. a foundationalist assertion uh, that is then f legitimized by faith. So, in other words, we we the we can see the whole. I mean, through God, you see the whole, uh, and and that then, and so it, I would say it's sort of like across all of them that then re is basically justifying its epistemological truth through faith, authority, and revelation. I mean, that's a sort of like, it's like you, you let go of your, um, you know, your preconceived notions and give yourself over to God. And through that process and holding that faith, you then see the reality of what God bestows in terms of, because a huge number, of course, of the claims are not really even epistemologically, empirically grounded across those, I mean, any of those frames. I mean, they're, you know, they would be tell you to be very suspicious of what any group of people believe other than those that have revealed the truth authority. Mm -hmm. Be wary mm -hmm. of your subjective opinion. Be wary, you know, natural, they grant natural philosophy objectivism to a soft subset yeah. of reality. You know, God yeah. is sitting out on the systems and, you know, we have, we have a, a line of truth to that through faith, revelation, and authority, you know, the, of, right. of the church. So we have the truth. There is the it's it's foundationalist you, truth. Otherwise, we have the truth. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's an ontological truth-based foundation that transcends sort of questionable or, or uh, transcend tries to tra get around epistemology, yeah. basically. Yep. Which, of course, why philosophy then is like, I mean, you can't just do that. <laughs> That's that's a re that's a revelation faith based authority that actually we argue now is bullshit. You know, it's like it's like that's the uh, so it's a, it's a, that's the difference between a theological epistemology maybe uh, than yeah. a, a philosophical uh, system that then requires a formal epistemology. It's a good way of putting it. It's a respectful way of putting it. Let me tell you a little bit about the book, and then I'll hear see if you have any things about the chapters you want to say. Okay. Yeah. I'm actually, I'd like to. Uh, so here's the way the book is right, and the book I'm writing the book so that I, uh, an educated, you know, graduate psychological level trained person who cares, um, can follow the argument. That's basically. Yeah. You know, and I do not at this stage in the game. Let's be clear. There's not a big audience for this shit. <laughs> okay. At, now there could be but they're not yet. So why do I say there could be? It's like, actually, if you, if you allowed people to think about it, there would be a subset of people that would care deeply, especially kids, you know, like graduate level people. However, the institution, in terms of zone of proximal development, it's, there's enough press on the system now that's starting to feel like it might like wake up and then change, but there's a lot of inertia and resistance to that. So it doesn't really want to uh, engage in a lot of, you know, reflection okay so i mean that's so there's so there's, so why did i not really situate it for an audience i was like i want to make the case so that 50 years from now you people can read and be like jesus christ this is so fucking clear <laughs> you know they can't not see this okay um so that's really what the audience is it's a down the line kind of deal um and and then after the argument is out there then we can market test it see where the zones of proximal development is and then figure out a way so that it can be really digested so make the case and then we'll streamline it. Okay, so here's the basic structural argument of the book. The structural argument of the book is there's a problem of psychology, okay? That mainstream academic psychology has an obvious co problem with coherence, okay? Um, and it's defaulted to a solution that is inadequate with modern empirical psychology. And that you can make a coherentist based argument that says it's incoherent and if you fail at the level of incoherence, that's a deep weakness for a knowledge. That's, a, that's one of the epistemological, um, you know, basis of justification. You know, is it, does it correspond to truth? And is it logically coherent? <laughs> okay, so that's part one. Mm -hmm. Then section two then says, I have a new metapsychology that affords coherence. Okay. Um, and that it affords coherence through a particular doorway that I am lit delineating as the metaphysical, meta-theoretical doorway, okay? Um, and I delineate that by saying, hey, there's actually a continuum, a metaphysical to empirical continuum of, of analysis, 
and that we need the entire continuum and to be aware of it. So on the one hand, you have empiricism, which is anchored to the data, okay? And then what are the observational data that we are grant? What are the contact that our map is making with the territory? And how does that data come back to show the coherent correspondent alignment of map to territory? Empiricism is that link. To know what the empiricism means, you need a, a hypothesis into a theory. The hypothesis in theory reflects the narrowing of a paradigm into a subject matter that then tells you how to set up your, what you're going to aspectualize and then the data you're going to get so you know what it means. Okay? And that this whole thing is what uh, Thomas Kuhn identified as normal science. So you live in a paradigm. Paradigm has sub-theories. The theories then yield hypotheses. The hypotheses then allow you to go out and collect data. You can do this in a pure experimental way, a quasi-experimental way, or a natural descriptive way. Okay? That's psychology. We look at psychology and what psychology collects of a subset of uh, or a collection of mid-level paradigms that now uh, occupy the territory of the field that they overlap and compete with. And I identify six classic, although there's many others. Um, uh, so there's a, you can cluster a number together through the evolutionary biological cluster, okay? Then there are classic psychological paradigms, behaviorism, cognitivism, humanistic and psychodynamic. And then there are the social systems and social connections to the social sciences and macro level social theorizing. So you get social systems. So those are social systems, biological systems, and four huge paradigms, okay? And, and those paradigms together make up the incoherent cluster of territory that then, you know, then you say you're living this incoherent cluster at the macro level, but then you go out and you do research programs and build all that stuff. Okay. I'm saying, hey, that's a problem. And there's a unified theory that actually gives a new architecture that allows for a meta theory that allows us to then create a relationship between the paradigms that's more coherent to show the way towards a meta coherent meta paradigm. And in order to do, and my first book was about that. So a new unified theory of psychology was a meta theoretical argument, okay, that assimilates and integrates the paradigms. But there's actually even in a deeper problem that also needs to be addressed. And that's the problem of our concepts and categories. That's a descriptive metaphysical problem. Okay. Now, why do we have a descriptive metaphysical problem? Why, why is the foundational root of, the, of our grammar do we have this fucking problem? Okay. So while the problem of psychology, you can say, well, it's a theoretical clusterfuck. Now what I'm saying, well, the, the reason that it's a theoretical clusterfuck is because our concepts and categories at their very base are not up to the task. Why are the concepts and categories not up to the task? Well, that's the uh, enlightenment gap. Okay, so at the very, very backdrop is that we are dependent upon enlightenment grammars and sensibilities for, for embarking on this task of the science of psychology, behavior and mental process. Okay. And, and at this level then, now, now you look at the enlightenment gap and say, yeah, actually, because we can say very clearly ever since the enlightenment, we really don't have a good mind-body solution, coherent understanding way of under And the nature of scientific knowledge and truth, where is it demarcated and how does it relate to social knowledge and truth is super confusing. And we have the modernist versus postmodern science wars and debates about foundationally different epistemologies about whether you can make true claims as a huge clusterfuck of debate, diagnosing that we don't have shared understanding about that issue either. So then now you have, so actually, once we understand the enlightenment gap, it's no surprise that we're metaphysically confused, which would then would mean we're meta-theoretically confused, and then we have paradigmatic clusterfuck. Okay. So uh, the unified theory then, here's this eight, eight different ideas, but we're going to emphasize four of them. And then that, now this gives rise to what I'm going to then invite to see is a zoomed out descriptive metaphysical meta-theoretical structure that puts the pieces together in a coherentist way that then allows you to see the empirical metaphysical whole. Okay. 
So then section three, section two of the book then says, hey, here's the unified theory. And here are then two core ideas that we need, novel ideas that the unified theory brings to bear that fills in the necessary structure that's going to set the stage for them, the correction. And that's the, the following chapters then are justification, uh, developed justification system theory and the tree of knowledge. The first two key ideas of the unified theory and together they're foundational ideas. And these are missing crucial metaphysical, meta-theoretical ideas, okay? All right, so then section three of the book as it's currently aligned as well, how do we upgrade our understanding of science writ large? Okay. And we can say, hey, there is an, um, there's emerging movements right now in modernity that says, hey, our scientific systems of understanding, we're not creating a coherent big picture view. Okay. And there are now movements to try to create a coherent big picture view of what science is. The tree of knowledge is going to grab three of those movements and jump us forward and now allow us to have a big picture view of science. And then you have three chapters making this case. Okay. There's chapter, the next chapter then that I have structure is the, uh, a new map of big history. So what I want to now show is big history came onto the scene, acknowledging that a big picture view of science is missing this time from the vantage point of history, and now has established that we can develop an interdisciplinary view of science writ large that, that is framed by present back to past, starting with the Big Bang and now coming forward. So that's one dimension. And very simple shit like quantum particles that happen back at Bang and energy that get stacked into chemistry and then go through biology and then get up to human. So there's a time by complexification architecture that big history allows us to see science and, th and they've made a lot of, you know, they've made a decent splash with this model, okay? And then I say, well, yeah, but they're missing some. We, they, they, they need, that's a good start, but that's not the good map. And the tree of knowledge upgrades your map seriously, okay? Because big history doesn't even, it goes from big life, like multicellular creatures to humans. <laughs> it doesn't even say anything about mind and sentience and then sentience into how, how that sets the whole fucking equation. So it misses psychology as a field, at least as the way the TOK thinks about, yet alone the problem of psychology, okay? So it's making claims about consilience, but it doesn't have a good metaphysic. It's just doing a naturalism, it's just doing naive scientific naturalism, really, you know? But you're not gonna get there because the science of psychology can't be solved with naive scientific naturalism. In fact, they don't even, they basically pretend it's not there. They repress and deny <laughs> the fact that there's psychology there. Yeah. So the tree of knowledge says, yep, here are the joint points. Here are the different dimensions of complexity. Here's a big upgrade. And now we have a new map of big history. It has exactly the same axes, only now it has a much better mm, argument. So then the next chapter then is, well, is this a sound philosophical argument? Okay, so this is, here's natural science doing what it did. Now I wanna ask the question from a philosophical perspective. And thankfully I found this book by Lawrence Calhoun as a philosopher, as a president of the Metaphysics Society who wrote a book called The Orders of Nature, okay? And he argued that philosophy was all fucked up by matter and mind because it was bipolar, but it should be thinking about nature as, a, as physical material into biological, into mental, into cultural. Those are his orders of nature. Okay, and I have the PDF of this book and I, I can send it to you if you want. Um, so this is a metaphysical, uh, and he basically lays out why philosophers don't do big picture naturalism and why scientists don't think about metaphysics. <laughs> okay, makes exact, I mean, this is the exact argument I make. So philosophers aren't doing metaphysical analysis of nat naturalism, naturalism and scientists are doing it naively. And when you do it sophisticatedly, you get a orders of nature picture that goes from the material to the living, to the mental, to the cultural, mm -hmm. okay? So now I basically say, yes, he did this in 2014. And when I showed him the TOK, he was like, oh fuck, I probably should have cited that thing. <laughs> All right. Which came out in 2003 and has a whole fucking book in 2011, okay? I, I mean, whatever, this is our silos, right? And I didn't, I mean, I found out of this book in 2018, so I didn't know about it for four years. Anyway, I'm 
I'm not making a critique. I'm just saying. So now you have a whole chapter that says, hey, they're really, and, and he argues very clearly, philosophers don't want, are mostly captured by postmodernism, and philosophy itself is fractured, okay? And they're not looking for grand systems. And they think that a grand naturalism, a grand metaphysical naturalism is naive, and scientists are doing it in naive ways. And so here's a sophisticated view. And look, lo and behold, it lines up completely with the tree of knowledge. Exactly. Okay. So now I'm a, I have my metaphysical grounding, my descriptive metaphysical grounding, and my naturalist grounding. Okay. And now then what I want to do is I want to do meta-theoretical and meta-modern grounding okay, to argue for a meta-modern sensibility. So then the third chapter, I say, here's Roy Bashkar, okay, a great 21st century meta theorist. He and Wilbur together offer a really potential nice synthesis. The unified theory is really this part of the sensibility. It's a scientific, philosophical, spiritual vision, okay, mm -hmm. like these. And it's like, so it's a new 21st century vision. I'm going to now yoke Roy Bashkar's claims about what science is. And he created a critical scientific realism that can bridge modernism and postmodernism. And the way he talked about science fits exactly the way the TOK. In fact, the TOK makes a few beautiful specifications that allows Roy critical realism to shine. Okay. So now we can upgrade Roy Bashkar with this ontic reality, onto epistemology model of scientific reality that says, yes, Roy, you did everything right, and I can fill in the gaps. And then that sets the stage for well, what, was, what, all of, what Roy Bashkar and Ken Wilber pointed to was the need for a fundamentally new sensibility. We got to get out of modernist empirical natural science and we need to appreciate the postmodern critique, but we need actually a synthetic meta-modern kind of view. So then I actually bring lean Rachel Anderson's meta-modernity into the equation and say, this is the tree of knowledge unified theories of meta-modernity view. And what it does is it captures men's knowledge, but it basically says we need to ground it in a wise philosophy and be wisdom oriented with it, okay? So now, now what we've done is we've now boxed in the big picture. So we have actually the enlightenment gap can now be framed and the tree of knowledge gives us a big picture view of science, its relationship to society, how certain scientific knowledge gives us transcendental realist claims, but also how we should wisely place scientific knowledge in relationship to other knowledge that has moral considerations and everything else. Okay, that's that section. To deepen this analysis, now we're gonna make a bridge into the next section. The next section is the problem of the enlightenment gap. The other half of it is the matter-mind relation proper. So this is society versus science. Now there's a matter-mind relation. And that's really where I can specify, okay? And then the next section then says, hey, the tree of knowledge says we can add another specification about the nature of science. That's actually gonna be crucial to this whole matter-mind problem and that's this issue of behavior. The tree of knowledge gives a radically new interpretation of behavior writ large. Okay? It argues that actually what science fundamentally about epistemologically and ontologically is behavior. It's an epistemological third person behavioral frame on how objects and fields change at different levels and dimensions of analysis. That's the ontological. Yeah. Okay? Now that's a radical thing because be guess where the term behavior came from? Watson, <laughs> John Watson gave rise to the term behavior. It was a, nobody used it before, but then it generalizes in science. Why? Well, this answers why. This sh and then I review John Watson, show why he was an idiot with regards to, he actually conflated epistemology and ontology, meaning that he was, he was saying, here's an epistemological claim, but also it's ontological physicalism, meaning that it's just neural reflex. That's an ontological claim, okay? Which is a dumb claim, basically. I mean, you know, I'm being flippant here in some ways, but it was a dumb claim, okay? And he tried to then get rid of phenomenology, right? Which is- yeah. cool. It's shallow. You know? Yeah. Um, although when he sees, it, when he talks about the philosophy, he's like, well, philosophers have to get together and agree on what they observe. So phenomenology, he does acknowledge that phenomenology comes, he tries to kick it back into philosophy. But as I write in my book, I'm like, but really everyday humans observe shit and talk about it, right? Right, John? <laughs> And I was like, you know, you, know, you can't forget that. Okay, that's part of our behavior. All right, so anyway, so now you have this argument of like, well, here's Watson introduces it, it spreads. The fact of the matter is, is that we can use the tree of knowledge to see behavior as the fundamental epistemological and ontological construct. 
that can actually be specified even more with a periodic table of behavior that comes in the next chapter. Okay. So now what we've done is we've like, okay, now we box science in even further with the con and, and bridged it over this concept of behavior. So science is really this attempt, basic science is attempt to describe the world in behavioral terms, just as Roy, just like Roy, just like Ken Wilber said. Okay. And then you can do it, you can do it individually or systemically, but yeah. as Wilbur said, those are both two lenses and they're behavioral systems and behavioral individual lenses on the world. And the tree, that's what the tree of knowledge grants you. The periodic table of behavior breaks it up into its individual parts. The tree of knowledge allows you to see the systemic whole and both of those together carry that epistemological third person view from a systems and an individual perspective. Okay. And I can even demonstrate that our problems empirically with defining what behavior is are solved by the periodic table of behavior. So I take examples where people don't know what behavior is and then show how the periodic table of behavior maps it. And then I also show that the um, current arrangement of the sciences are clearly organized along the periodic table of behavior. So you go from particles and the standard theory of elementary particle physics into atoms and the periodic table and then into chemistry. And then you go into scale and all of that's the material sciences, earth sciences, astronomy, and astrology, uh, not astrology, <laughs> cosmology. Okay? Mm. Then you go up to the bi biological sciences, you have genes and the fundamental molecular biological structure, which bridges from chemistry over, then you get cell theory, and then you get multi-cell theory and ecology. All that's organized. Then you get, you jump up a level short of, you get into neuroscience, and all of that is STEM. Okay. And then the shit goes to the fan in the sense that you get ethology, zoology into ethology. That's trying to be a biological difference, but that actually overlaps tremendously with comparative psychology. You get behavioral science and you get then this whole clusterfuck about what is the next science. Psychology is this clusterfuck. And then you go into the social sciences and God only knows where that is. So actually the clarity breaks down the periodic table of behavior says, actually, we should think about mental behavior as this dimension and then into cultural behavior at this dimension. And psychology is going to be organized properly here. It ought to be. It hasn't been, but it ought to be. That's the prediction. It's, it's disorganized, but it can become organized. Okay. So then that breaks that section. So that's a two chapter section that basically says behavior is the key. And that now is bridged over from the science. Now the final section of the book then says, well, we're still left with mental processes. Okay? We need a metaphysics of mental process that bridges into meta theory. And that's what the final section of the book is. So then I have a chapter on the map of mind, which is the descriptive metaphysics, which we just went through. So it's like, hey, mm -hmm. there are these five different sections, mind one A and B, mind two, mind three A and B. This is a much cleaner way to talk about the different reference points, okay? Now the theory is that there's actual clear dynamic information interface between these domains, okay? Like we should be able to say, hey, this is what the neurocognitive functionalism is. This is what behaviorism is. This is the emergence of mind two and the emergence of mind three. We should have meta theories that tie the dynamic interface between all these different domains together. Okay? And then I lay that case out then. I have a chapter and this is what Andrea read. So that then the chapter 12 says, hey, here's behavioral investment theory, which is a theory of mind, meta theory of mind one, okay? Then we have um, the framing of mind two, subjective conscious experience, okay? Then there's mind to be, which is then gonna get, gets into the relational world and the influence matrix and Tomasello's arguments about how intersubjectivity. Mm -hmm. And then we get into mind three and the culture person plane of existence. So we turn to justification and fill that in and fill it in so that we can then say human psychology then hooks into the evolution of the social world and there's social technologies and justifications and boom. And now this human psychology plugs into the social sciences. Now we have a map of mental process, okay? That metaphysically, metatheoretically fills that in and then boom, you have resolved sovereign of psychology and the enlightenment gap. And then the final chapter is, well, if we do that, that's a whole fucking ball game difference. <laughs> if that actually works, 
Trust me, that's a lot packed into that argument. And it leverages us now fundamentally for a whole different way of thinking about knowledge, which, by the way, is absolutely necessary given everything's collapsing around us as modernity dies and we need a wise metamodern upgrade. And oh, by the way, here this puts a lot of the fucking pieces together. And it even comes with a fucking approach to unified psychotherapy that actually tells you to calm your heart and do all the other things. So that's my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get back. Oh, well, those of us that do clinical work, you know, I was like, well, what does this actually mean? I was like, actually, that's where it started. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So where do we go from here? Um Well, it's about two o'clock. We didn't get to yeah. everything. Uh, so I got a, I, I got another 15 minutes if we want to, um, you know, so that we bring this to a close and then. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed the conversation. I love the fun. Yeah, this is great. This is really great. I would love that Orders of Nature PDF if you can. Of course. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm thinking maybe next time we can, because we, we, we did a pretty good job today, I think, of addressing ontology and epistemology. Um, and I know Andre has questions about uh, ontological emergentism and epistemological emergentism. Yeah, and I don't even know what he's referring to exactly, but I have a lot of questions about emergent properties. So I imagine we're kind of asking about the same thing. Perfect. I tell you what, I'll, how about I, I'll bring up the orders of nature. We'll talk about this. This will be a good bri bridge, okay? So let me bring up, the, there's a summary slide on the orders of nature, all right, um, that, uh, that be a good sort of bridge point then if we get into emergence and reductionism next time all right yeah uh, that'll be a good uh transition. guys i have just to go to the bathroom from what yeah. one minute yeah go ahead if you need a little break then we'll we'll spend 10 yeah. minutes on this slide i'll find let me find it because I, I, I know where it is but uh wait one second Here's another question for you, Greg. Mm -hmm. Does justification, can, can one justify without propositional language? Does it exist at the level of mind too? Um, at least the way you define it. No. Okay. The short answer is no. So that that there's definitely precursors. Yeah. Um, because there's like experiential reinforcement. I mean, that's the whole thing with behavioral investment theory, and that's yeah. like a type of right. A type of justification, I guess, or maybe that justification is a type of that, really. So. So you enter, uh, there's a beautiful clip um, on macaque monkeys that I call the Romeo Juliet clip that I show my students. Okay? Um, and it's this unbelievable depiction of the, well, yeah. um, hey, good. I'm, he asked about justification pre-propositional language, um, which is a great question because there, there's- Pre-pre- 
Prepositional. Right. Before propositional language, is there is there okay. justification? And the answer is not technically, but there's all of the interpersonal dynamics that are around it, okay, without the narrative layering an explicit system, right. but you will see a huge amount of essentially getting active, okay? Um, because the shared investment influence space basically is trying to legitimize is and ought in term enacted, right. okay? But it's not formal justification. And I was telling him there's this great clip, which I can also send if you, um, uh, it's called the Triumph of Life series. And it's the four series in this Triumph of Life six part video, I think it is called Brain Power. It's an hour, 10 long, minute long analysis, which basically uh, based on behavioral investment theory. I mean, it's a beautiful articulation of understanding brain behavior and brain evolution and, and behavior evolution for an hour for a nature program. And at the 37th minute, they're tracking macaque monkeys. Okay, so they, because they've, and, and this, by the way, this is exactly the domain of relational world that I talk about. So this is the third step towards consciousness. Uh, and now they're saying, hey, if, when you get into macaque monkey tribes, it's everything's about cooperation and competition and status and sex, <laughs> okay? Um, and knowing your place and who your allies are and how to manage that. So they show this clip of, uh, of, of a dominant monkey and they're basically, because the dominant in this world, dominant monkeys have access to females and they live in basic harems and subordinate monkeys, male monkeys then try to often uh, have little tris, okay? But the dominant monkey then has, so, he, so you see this picture, there's the, the alpha male sit, sleeping at a tree, okay? And then you get a young male monkey goes over, sees that a female is in heat because she's all flush in her face, that's how they're in heat, okay? And he goes, and he sends signals, all right? And she checks him out and he sends signals. She's like, all right, <laughs> okay? So they make eyes and then they run off to hide out of sight of the male monkey who's also asleep, okay? And so boom, and then they, they see a little scene of copulating. It's funny, they actually kiss each other as they're copulating. And you're like, oh my God, you know? <laughs> like, and then the answer is, he may be asleep, but he has spies. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. So he has second and third in command that, that monitor and these guys then track and they see him. And then he's like, and so the spies are alert. And so they call out, <laughs> oh, you know, and so wow. they send out the signal and immediately the monkey, the big ass monkey gets up and then takes off and then beats the shit out of the little monkey for, you know, wow. for doing, for being unjustified. Right. You know, so, and it's like, it's all Romeo and Juliet without the narrative. Right. Thank um, goodness. That's so, crazy. Yeah, it's really, it's really. Um, so, so did they justify? Now, the what I tell them, them is that you can see all the behavioral investment influence dynamics there. You see the competition, cooperation, the sex, the aggression. I mean, it's all right there. Mm -hmm. But what happened for us is when the if the monkey caught doing eyes, for instance, and the spy saw him, and I'll say, but nothing yet happened. Now the big monkey can come and say, well, what were you thinking? Why were you doing that? Okay. You know, like, hey, I didn't mean to. <laughs> right? So now what the problem is, you can't do that. The monkeys can't track intention. Okay. They can't assess the subjective intention with any level of direction. They can't directly access what you're intending to do, why you did it. Okay. They, they can't self-reflect. They can't self-reflect. And the other, you can't ask what, just hang out with your dog. Like when your dog makes a mess, like my dog is occasionally, you know, rips shit up. Why did you do that? <laughs> you can't. Guys, sorry, it. sorry, guys. I I have to go. Okay. Sorry, right, we. Uh, yeah, we're we keep in touch. Maybe we. Yeah. Yep. No, I'll show you real fast. I'll send you both the the PDF. I'll yeah. send it to Nick, and then we'll we'll wrap up. Okay. Here, here in about five minutes anyway. See you. So. Bye. Right. Bye, guys. Take care. Bye, bye. Okay. So. Uh, I'll show you this slide and then I'll show you the PDF. So I find this article, I mean, this book, um, I immediately see the title. It's, and, and it makes my whole fucking case. I mean, it's, just, it's a two, so, it, so an integrative philosopher who then becomes a president of the metaphysics society makes exactly the TOK case. So that's cool. <laughs> In 2014, without any knowledge of mine. It's almost like your alien argument. Mm -hmm. Yep.
Exactly. Well, you certainly convergent validity among humans. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so, the, so he, and this is, you'll see right away. Um, okay. So this is all this. I'm going to fly through this. This is, we had a, a, a mini conference on the TOK in 2000, but we had a bigger conference in 2018. And then this is a mini conference of all the shit we learned. I'll, I could walk you through it at some point. Um, and then this was the things that I was working on. Okay, so here is the, here's the orders of nature book, okay? And it basically reviewed, I guess this is 2013, I should be aware of that. Anyway, um, it basically reviews the problem of what he calls the bipolar split between matter and mind, okay? And argues that there should be, he called it a systematic metaphysics that bridges philosophy with, nat with whole big picture natural science accounts. And he then argued why this doesn't happen at all, because the philosophers and the scientists, the institutions where they currently are, are fundamentally defined against both, pro like uh, the natural scientists are defined against philosophical metaphysics, and the philosophers are defined against big picture views. Yeah. The, the, um, so, but he's like, but this is stupid, because <laughs> this, is, this is really the project of philosophy, all right? Here's his mental orders of nature. Okay. Uh -huh. Start with the Big Bang. Okay. And you have this physical radiation error, which, by the way, corresponds with this dot here, corresponds to what I call energy. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. You get these quantum fields and you get the matter error. Okay. Um, this big frozen gluons, right? Right down here is a well, it's a quark gluonic plasma after once the initial initiation happens, and then there's a differentiation, and now you get into the matter error. Exactly, you know. Uh, now, I would, I don't know why I criticize them a little bit that the matter error that this circle should come down here and include the, the material should have matter in it, but anyway. Um, yeah. He then want, he, he then defines the material basically as the normal size and chemical worlds is the material. So normal size relative to humans, like the cup and what we're interacting with, it's grounded in uh, what we can see and things like that. So he has an interesting distinction between the physical and material that I don't. Uh, I have a comment there because I was I was thinking earlier, like if material if material is we can consider it matter. Mm -hmm. or at least a, an expression of matter. So does material, is that sort of like a transcendent form, an emergent form of reality? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Is that yeah. different than he's saying it though? No, that's exactly what he's saying. He's saying oh. that there's a base, um, there's the foundation of physical radiant energy mm -hmm. out of which the material emerges and evolves. Definitely. That's what these lines okay, are. Yeah. Including transcendent. Right. And then this is com this is complexity. And then each of these are higher order levels of emergent organization. Yeah. Okay. Um, across the dimension of complexification. That's what this yep. arrow, these arrows are getting. Now he doesn't divide out time. He's just saying, well, time also. Um, the tree of knowledge gives us a nice representation on the time axis, but he does it. Okay. Um, in fact, the first TOK drawing I drew basically is this drawing. This is the first TOK drawing that I drew, if you correspond it to this, because I didn't have the time axis on that. So then you go into the elements. There's also then, he, he doesn't really get clarity about the scale dynamic. Scale is kind of complex. But then, then he jumps up and then he has the life, or sometimes he calls it life, sometimes he calls it the biological. Here he calls it the biological, okay? And notice what he's getting here. These arrows, these are complex feedback loops. Right. Okay. That are generating the emergence of complexity. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's some transition from macromolecules into cells, bacteria, base cells, right here. That's the life transition point. Okay. Right. Um, and that's natural selection. And then the way it changes the planet, then all of a sudden gives rise to big life here. Okay. Now, here's the difference between us. Okay. He wants to identify the mental with mind too, with the hard problem of consciousness, and thinks about it as emerging in birds and mammals. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So the difference here is, is that he sees the Cambrian explosion as crucial in complex animals, but this is still biology and not the jump into sentience yet. Yeah, he draws a line jump. on the other side. Okay. Which that's not unusual. A lot of people do that. Okay. Right. But but the only so this right here, I will take the biology and draw it right here, and then I'll expand this circle to include this arrow. And this then the mental would come down to include things like insects. Okay. Right. Because look, there was that one video on the list or the other day that, that about that spider that can well, I mean, if you don't think of insects as mental, okay, I mean, there's, you know, I think that's a mistake. I mean, I think that insects are, I mean, look at what bees, what bees do and the way they communicate, what ants do and all of that stuff. And all the comparative psychologists, the early comparative psychologists studied like ant behavior and all of that. So there's yeah. certainly a very strong argument to be made. Um, it's a little, it's certainly debatable. We may find that they are robots. And if you define mental as having to have sentience. That's not an unreasonable thing. And it's a little bit from a behavioral perspective, though, I, I think by the time you're at insects, you're at a fundamentally qualitatively different level of behavior. Um, yeah. You have the neurocognitive functionalist view. So I think that it's much more defensible to draw the line here, but whatever, that's the, the, that's the one difference. And then only homo sapiens get into the cultural dimension. And he defines that as language and reason giving and the reason that language results in uh, shared. Uh, and I think I have a diagram here. So this is the way, you know, this corresponds to this, okay? In fact, yep. this right here goes back to energy. That's what really what he's getting at here. And then life is here. And then the mental, although there is a slight difference, and then the cultural. And by the way, he traces really the evolution of reason giving in a very similar way that ends with science. And then he, are, he his last section of the culture is how the evolution of epistemology that gives rise to science that then allows you to come back and start to map this stuff with some objective claims. So it's a, it's a basically his orders of nature book has just enormous parallel um, with the. Uh, I mean, clearly. So yeah, completely convergent validity. You know? Yeah. I mean, that's the. And, and, all, and what this does is what, we can consolidate a coherent naturalism. Mm. And if we get a flexible, coherent naturalism in order, then we can hang with the wisdom traditions. I mean, this is what Wilbur does, you know, we can right. hang with the wisdom traditions and we can have flexible, open dialogue about ultimate reality and be like, yeah, <laughs> you know, we'll land on somewhat different places, but we don't need to like, like have, you know, wars about it. <laughs> <laughs> like ideological wars about it and belittle people and, and do all of this. We can, we can find a flexible system of justification. So anyway. Wow. Well, that, that, that's also fascinating. Thank, thank you so much for, sh for sharing all this stuff with me and just including me in this. this I mean, I'm going to have to digest all this over the next few days, but this is just awesome. Great, man. Hey, I appreciate you on the journey with me and we're just, yeah. You know, there, there's a lot here. The question is, if I can dump it into you guys and then you guys learn how to distill it, that's, you know, that's what we need because I'm too hot. You know, I'm just, uh, just all over the damn place. But if I can get it to you and you mm -hmm. guys can distill it and you get it to other people, uh, then that's a, so I really appreciate your time and I love doing this. So, of course. Yeah. All right, man. Rock on. Take care. Yeah.